रोशनी का कारवां दिस पॉडकास्ट इज ब्रॉट टू यू बाय स्कोर फाउंडेशन Hi my name is George Abraham and welcome to Iway Conversations my guest today is Siddhan Shah from Mumbai he is an architect hi siddhan welcome hi george thank you so much so siddhan uh, you are an architect that's an interesting profession when it comes to people with vision impairment so what exactly are you specialized in so uh, george yes uh, my profession uh, is architecture and after that i did my masters in heritage management with the focus on making cultural and heritage sites monuments accessible for persons with disability and it is post that in between where i was diagnosed with tunneling vision so i think my career came first and then my disability that i got to know about it and but i think you know it it is an interesting career choice because it allows you to understand how space plays an important role in our day to day life and how the need to make it more inclusive and accessible uh, what actually prompted you to be interested in this uh, area because so, the diagnosis uh, came later right yes the diagnosis came later but my prompt into the space was two things one was that my mother was detected with uh, an eye condition that has now like reached a level where she has only 30% vision distorted vision and it was that that really made me look at space planning understanding elements of universal design because sadly in architecture we are not taught much about it and not much recognition is given to this particular uh, element because it is always treated as an elective against like you know you could select like landscaping universal design or something else so it really pushed me to think about this particular space and the second most important thing was because while i was in my third final year of architecture i had won a competition which was hosted by unesco and asi along with my two friends uh, jay and siddiq to create solutions for making world heritage sites in india disable friendly and we had done things for ajanta and elora caves so these were two things that really got me excited and got me to work in this particular domain of art culture heritage and accessibility this place where you learnt uh, architecture uh, where was that and uh, did you learn your heritage management also uh, in the same uh, inst- institution or organization or you had to go somewhere else so i did my architecture from mumbai uh, nmims university balwan shet school of architecture and yeah. post that i received a fellowship to go and study uh, in greece i went to athens to study heritage management and it was a dual university course that was hosted by university of kent in uk and athens university of economics and business in greece and that's where i learned about this because i think greece being the mecca of art culture heritage you know like it it really was the place where one could understand and it was fantastic to see the considerations the way designs of site management of archaeological sites and monuments was considered keeping in mind persons with disability and their needs so and nowhere nowhere compromising on the idea of the heritage that was there so i think these elements really got me thinking about how to look at art spaces look at cultural sites and monuments in an accessible way If you know of anyone with vision impairment who needs guidance on living life with blindness please share the IWA National Toll Free Helpline number 18005320469 the number is 18005320469 when you finished with your uh, uh, postgraduate degree from greece uh, you came back to india and uh, 
uh, what was your next venture? So when I came back to India, I started working with the city palace in Jaipur to look at how can the the palace and the museum can be made more inclusive and accessible. Uh, along with that, we also I was the resource consultant for the National Museum under the agencies of uh, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, where we they were creating with various other partners from IIT Delhi and other Saksham and other organizations. They were create we are creating this tactile gallery, which is called Anubhav, a tactile gallery experience. So I was largely looking at the space through the lens of a resource consultant and trying to play the role of an of a moderator between the museum, the other agencies, and creating the space and making sure that the facilities were provided. And also looking at elements of technology like having transcripts online, having uh, low tech guides, audio guides that were created in the space along with the tactile and braille and other aspects for the Anubhav Gallery. So that is what I started with. And since then, we've been working with different art galleries, museums in India and abroad. And that led us to work in various other corporates, other organizations like schools, institutions as well. With the advent of uh, smartphones yeah. and the internet, uh, yeah. have you actually uh, also started bringing in an experience where uh, when a blind person visits a uh, a uh, 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 monument, whether it's Elora Caves or whether it is uh, the National Museum or goes to a fort, um, can the experience in terms of uh, description be yes. uh, be kind of generated through the technology? Yes. So what we have started using is uh, we have been creating these QR codes with the tactile flux and the tactile braille content that's there. And the QR code also has the braille, the audio description of the monument or of the room or the gallery that they are in, or even in some cases of the artwork which is there. Uh, the tactile description gives them an idea about the artist, about the artwork, breaking it down into different elements of its textural qualities, mediums that it is used, what is the theme that it is depicting. And, you know, what are the elements that are there? And we follow a simple process along with, like, having the same QR code experience for sign language as well. So these are smaller interventions. Uh, for children, largely, uh, during COVID, we started doing a lot of online engagement with regards to cultural heritage and monuments. And, like, talking to them about the ideas of our own city or, like, even looking at your own culture through the objects in your house and creating virtual experiences of a museum that they could experience, you know, using. Because, so that's where, you know, sometimes it's interesting how architecture can come handy. We, we are trained in creating 3D virtual models or the 3D virtual worlds. Yeah. And we, we started creating them for like small, smaller museum setups, you know. We, we could create our own museums virtually. And that became an experience for children across the country or like anywhere who had access to our link could be part of our workshops. And largely we worked with, you know, like schools that dealt with children on the spectrum or other learning disability so that they didn't have to go out anywhere, but they could still have the experience of our cultural heritage right in the comforts of their own home. Accessibility and, um, you know, the area of work that you are specializing in is relatively new in the country and relatively unknown. So uh, how do you actually find work? Because uh, do do these uh, uh, outfits kind of approach you or uh, you actually go out and kind of sell your services? So uh, George, I would say like, it was extremely difficult for us when we started, but uh, I think we had a great support from the Ministry of Culture and the National Museum that that promoted and helped us get in touch with various different government agencies and, and work with different museums. They, they played an important role initially. and But still, even today, we have to go out there, inform people. And it has now been seven years that of what Access for All has been doing. And now people understand and they come to us to ask us, you know, if we could do uh, Access Audit for them. But otherwise, so... 
on the scale of 1 to 10 i would say it's 6 to 6, six and a half projects that we write for and we may get three or four out of it and it's three projects or two and a half projects that come to us you know from from the industry itself so because also a lot of people there is this constant it's a chicken and an egg situation sadly yeah yeah when i when i approach them they are like oh but we don't have anybody coming in and when you approach the community and you know that is where our audience research really helped us understand that the community has only one thing saying that we would like to go there but there's nothing for us over there in that space like oh, there is no facility additional elements that we would need right so that is the, the thing and we realize that it is important to reach out to these museums and because a person with disability is only disabled because of the lack of the infrastructure in the society i think the infrastructure disables the person services disable the person you know and if you have them in place everybody can easily utilize things i was also intrigued to hear you say that uh, you had uh, uh, support from the ministry of culture and uh, and uh, the 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 national uh, museum, museum. Yeah. Uh, how did that happen? Because um, uh, you know, <laughs> I think I think somewhere that I would say was pure serendipity, and I think where this is where you know sometimes life gets more philosophical. Uh, it was actually like I had just come back from from Greece, and at the same time, National Museum had had proposed a plan for creating a gallery for. Uh, a tactile gallery for the visual impaired groups and other uh, persons with disability. Yeah. And I was just in Delhi taking a Japanese friend who had come with me. And we had literally gone to see the museum. I had no idea that this museum is planning to do this. And I bumped into the curator. We got talking. And he's like, no, no, no. You need to meet the person who is looking after the thing. They took me to the director. And within three days, I was on board as a resource consultant for the project. You mentioned that you do a lot of work in schools. Yeah. Uh, talk me through some of the stuff that you do in schools. So, for example, we work with uh, schools to make make the school premises accessible one. Yeah. Uh, looking at inclusion. If the school wants to look at integrated solutions, how can they make the classroom space accessible? Also, uh, we... Access for All has two people who specialize in learning disability management and they look at teacher training programs, they look at curriculum development, also representation of inclusion in the curriculum, you know. How do they bring in the idea of diversity, accessibility, disability in, in various different uh, research and design and topics. So that way we look at, we work with the school, aid them in different ways and also create we create tactile and braille content we create content in an easy read format we also create content uh, in sign language and other formats for like those on the spectrum so that way we have been able to work with schools across the country based on the needs and the requirements that they've had uh, i should have asked this in the beginning but what is the vision for access for all so for us we uh, we are in a seventh year and we're looking at our vision for 2030 as of now because the way we have seen access for all also grow in a certain way and the kind of technological know-how and the basic elements that we have created for us we really would like to collaborate with other agencies of course in india but also take it to other economies that are similar to us in asia and southeast asia where we can make a deeper impact because when we started, we did not have a textbook to follow. We didn't have one particular guide to follow. But as we started doing things, as we started creating, making museums accessible, making monuments accessible, looking at classrooms. And also one thing that, that we feel that we excel in doing is working with low resources. Because initially when we started, we had extremely limited budgets, but we had access for all had to prove itself that, you know, we were capable of making sure that accessibility could be looked at. And that also really helped us in fundraising capacities and writing grants and reaching out to people in different capacities for the organizational needs. So we want to take this know-how and, and collaborate more with other similar organizations who are starting out or who are already there 
and work with them because india itself is a massive country and secondly as much as you would like to go outside of india we also want to go deeper in the country and start looking at second tier and third tier city to see what are the facilities and elements that are brought into that space because one of the biggest challenge there is a lack of awareness you know and the social stigma that is associated with disability so we really want to work towards that in that's our immediate vision for 2030 and one more thing that we have started doing post uh, covid is that we have been working extensively on digital accessibility so while we audit the physical space of a school or an organization or a museum we have also started doing that for their uh, websites for their social media content how can they start looking at making any digital engagement more inclusive and accessible so this is where we are and we really hope to work in this domain and while we are doing this i want i continue to teach because i feel that more students who do that in different domains we will be able to have individuals professionals who will start thinking in an inclusive way and you know we may aim towards becoming making our own country quite accessible to support our work with the blind and visually impaired you can visit the donate page on our website www.scorefoundation.org.in please note www.scorefoundation.org.in you know uh, you uh, went to greece 8 uh, to 10 years ago um, to to yeah. uh, do the scores now um, you've been in india working in india doing various projects in india uh, i believe there is a strong need given the size and scale of this country for more people qualified to do the work you are doing and no. therefore more architectural schools need to kind of uh, maybe offer this program at a postgraduate level uh, are you kind of doing anything for that recently the governing bodies that work with architecture right like council of architecture or like indian institute of architects have been looking at like how they can bring in universal design but as such there is no specialization or a course that has been offered in in any of these institutes uh, i have personally written to various deans of different architecture colleges or like even because architecture falls under the the te category te stands for technical education uh, i have written to some of the people there also but sadly this always is seen as something that's not like the need of the hour which i feel is completely wrong but we've been pushing for it i had my opportunity of you know teaching at nid which is the national institute of design and they have said that they would like to bring this more integrated into the curriculum rather than having this as an elective program so i am hoping that we are able to bring this in mainstream education of design and architecture uh, the the monuments which have been created the hundreds of years ago there is uh, it, only retrofitting can be done there correct but the newer uh, building especially the buildings which are potentially going to be monuments of tomorrow uh, uh, i'm sure uh, the the accessibility features can definitely be brought in uh, are there uh, newer potential monuments that you have visited uh, like for example the the statue of sardar patel in uh, gujarat or uh, some of the other other monuments potent future monuments have you seen the idea of accessibility being integrated into the designing process so uh, i haven't been to the, the statue of uh, unity but what i have seen in newer monuments so just recently i was in delhi and i went to the war memorial which is there the national war memorial yeah i think that space is is brilliantly created in terms of considerations for persons with disability and considering universal design as elements uh, in the space but sadly what happens is that these spaces are again like it's all about the wheelchair access or you will have some braille plugs in in one or two places what we lack is an integrated solution or an integrated approach towards disability inclusion of and design meaning particularly for persons with uh, different needs you know uh, the space that is there would have a ramp 
it has certain elements but they, they are they're all scattered there is no one complete thing that is there like it, it kind of just is like different areas have different things over there so while of course there is a tick in the box that a ramp is available on site a wheelchair accessible toilet is available on site there is no integrated solution that one can cater to and say that okay yeah these are all the things that are put together and you know it makes a complete experience for various different other group members when you talk about accessibility and inclusion uh, mm -hmm. how important should dignity and safety be no definitely i think dignity safety and also i think as you were saying like i also one thing that we believe is that accessibility is also about the experience you know yeah and dignity and safety caters to that particular experience in a big big way like having a ramp but you know not having a handle and hence looking for somebody to take you down the ramp or like in, in those aspects just becomes very very difficult for a person so in in that order i I am completely on board with the two words that you use. You know, and the third word that I would like to add is experience. That these three things make a person feel the way they are. Like, and they can go around on on their own in in that in that space and experience it in their way, rather than being forced to experience in a way that would not be comfortable for them. So you know, I think also one of the things is that having the availability of choice. You know. at an airport you get a choice of using a flight of steps or an escalator or an elevator yeah. you make a decision right yeah why is anybody who is coming to your space should have the luxury of making their own decision as a final question i would like to ask you uh, is there a message uh, that you would like to give uh, budding architects three points for any designer or any architect or anyone you know who's dealing with the space is that one to always consider that accessibility while you are designing it should not be considered as an option you know it needs to be considered as something that is mandatory that is something that you you do it it can't it can't just be a virtue that you add in your design oh yeah. let me add one ramp it can't be that approach it has to be integrated second thing is you have to design for flexibility and agility that you know if somebody is going to use it at this particular height or if somebody is going to have like like a simple thing like i was i was amazed uh, george when i went to the tate modern museum in uk yeah. and in in the washrooms they have a signage that says that we use non fragrant soap so that it doesn't affect anybody who could get triggered by an uh, all factory sense so it is it is a to see that level of detailing that goes in and that's something that i would like to add to as a second comment is that accessibility requires detailing you know the, there is a very famous saying in architecture that the god is in the details and it is literally when it comes to to architecture and accessibility and yeah third is that remember that accessibility is an incremental approach one of the major mistakes that i have seen a lot of professionals from the industry or others also who 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 do that is that they want to do everything in just one go and that is something that i personally and we personally are access for all fields that is not the right approach because you need to break down every need and then start catering to one need at a time so that you create an incremental approach and make the space that you are providing for in an in an inclusive way because otherwise when you start doing everything you don't even cater to one particular need that is required so yeah i think these would be my three things to <laughs> any budding designer anyone who is listening to our podcast and that don't make accessibility a virtue make it a part of your life you know it, it has to be something that routine and i'm sure together we can definitely make our spaces our country and this world an inclusive space for everyone Yep so on that note uh, let me uh, thank you Siddhant for taking the time and uh, uh, having this conversation wish you the very best thank you thank you so much George I wish ye roshni ka karwa This podcast was brought to you by Score Foundation Shanika
Academy.